Bienvenue aux Jeux Olympiques Paris 2024. The Olympics are by far the biggest sporting event. Yeah, the World Cup is a close second. But the Olympic Games are always followed with great interest, even by people who don't have a sporting personality. The reason for this is the history that comes with the Olympics. And when we talk about the most popular sports, athletics, swimming, and gymnastics, these are some of the most legendary. However, the most global of sports, football, has always seemed to fly under the radar in the Olympics. Yet the history of football at the Olympics is pretty fascinating, and will leave you wondering why you've never followed or cared about this before. So let's take a look at the history from the very beginning. We'll then go into exploring how the teams qualify, which of them are the most successful, what the rules are, and perhaps most interestingly of all, why football always starts before the opening ceremony. Now, as you may know, football was born in the mid 19th century, but did not become popular until the very end of it. However, when the first Olympic Games were held in Athens in 1896, football was not on the agenda of the biggest sporting event, yet. It made its debut four years later at the 1900 Paris Games, which was, in fact, one of the first major international football tournaments. Initially, the rules were flexible, with different team compositions and ranking methods. In contrast to today's strict qualification rules, early Olympic football consisted mainly of exhibition matches, with club teams sometimes representing a particular nation. At the third Olympic Games in 1904, for example, cities were involved in the form of teams. Thessaloniki and Athens, the two largest cities in Greece, were among the participants. From 1908, the rules for participation became a little stricter, based mainly on the rules of British football at the time. The teams were made up of amateur players, following the Olympic policy of amateurism, which excluded professional athletes. This meant that many talented players from the growing professional football leagues were not eligible. In fact, this is one of the basic rules that has remained in place to this day, although it has been modified to include mainly players under the age of 23. Yes, that's the slight modification to the rule that we're talking about. But at the end of the day, the important part is that the idea has endured for over 100 years. At that time, qualification was mostly by invitation, with countries sending their teams without strict pre-qualification rounds. In the 1920s, the rules were gradually tightened with the introduction of regional qualifiers and a clearer set of rules. At the 1924 Paris Olympics, Uruguay stunned the world by winning the gold medal, demonstrating their footballing prowess and foreshadowing their future World Cup success. At this time, the tournament was a mix of emerging football nations and traditional European powerhouses that are at the heart of international football in the modern era. The 1928 Olympic Games in Amsterdam continued this trend, cementing football's place in the Olympic movement and setting the stage for the sport's global development. Then came the 1930s, arguably the most pivotal decade in football's evolution, which made football go from the sport everyone loves to the most popular game on the planet. 1930 saw the first independent national football tournament open to nations from around the world. The idea had been proposed a year earlier by Jules Ramey, known as the father of the World Cup who suggested the establishment of a brand new tournament to be called the World Championship. The creation of the World Cup, however, slowed down the development of football at the Olympic Games. That's actually why FIFA dropped the sport from the 1932 Los Angeles Games in order to promote the brand new tournament. Then, at the 1936 Berlin Olympics, the International Olympic Committee not only reintroduced football, but also adopted a new format a direct knockout stage, moving away from the previous round-robin system. This change in format added to the excitement, but also exposed the disparity in team strength. The tournament was once again dominated by European teams, with Italy taking gold after defeating another side from Europe, Austria. The Olympic Games were not held for the next 12 years due to the Second World War, but returned in 1948 with London hosting. The tournament now saw the participation of 18 nations, including India, who famously played barefoot. In the gold medal match, Sweden defeated Yugoslavia, underlining the competitive nature of the tournament. Over the next 20 years, however, fans witnessed the total domination of the Eastern Bloc countries, particularly the Soviet Union. Yeah, up to that point, there had been a dominance of European countries when it came to gold medal winners. But in the 50s and 60s, that feeling intensified many times over. But let's see exactly what kind of dominance we're talking about, and then we'll clarify the reason for it. Now, between 1948 and 1972, an Eastern Bloc nation was a finalist in the football tournament at every edition of the Olympics. 
with two teams from the communist bloc facing each other on five occasions. In 1952, Hungary versus Yugoslavia. 1956, Soviet Union versus Yugoslavia. 1964, Hungary versus Czechoslovakia. 1968, Hungary versus Bulgaria. And 1972, Poland versus Hungary. Now, the reason for this is simple. Professionalism began to take over the sport, but all of this during a time when amateurism was still in force. Let me explain. The Soviet Union, as well as all other big nations of the Eastern Bloc, were ready to sponsor and train their amateur athletes in the most modern and efficient way for that time. Well, as it turns out, they were so successful in preparing them for the competition that their athletes were only amateurs on paper. In reality, they were by far the best footballers in the world. And thus, the International Olympic Committee decided to abandon the amateur rule because of the enormous disparity between the capacities of the Western and Eastern Bloc powers, and especially the huge dominance of the latter, which won 23 of the 28 medals between 1948 and 1980. The 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles marked the turning point in allowing professional players to take part. Of course, not all professionals were eligible, only those who did not have the privilege of taking part in World Cup qualifiers. The change was intended to make the tournament more competitive and attractive, and the country that seemed to benefit the most was France, who won the gold medal in 1984. The 1992 Olympic Games in Barcelona saw another significant change, the introduction of the under-23 rule, which is still in force and allows only three overage players per team. The rule was designed to balance the competition and provide a platform for young talent. Spain won gold on home soil, ushering in a new era for Olympic football. In general, the 1990s are the most significant for the current state of Olympic football, as no other major changes have been made since then. Overall, the International Olympic Committee has always held on to the idea that football will always be a platform for emerging talent, like Barcelona's Pedri at the 2020 Olympics. The logic here is that if you're one of the really big stars in your country, you'll have a chance at the World Cup or at the Continental Championships, the Copa America, European Championship, Africa Cup of Nations, etc. However, if you really want to represent your country at the Olympics, you can be selected as one of the three overage players. One of the biggest examples of this is Neymar, who won the 2016 tournament as a 24-year-old after scoring that memorable penalty in the shootout against Germany in the final. And with Pedri and Neymar mentioned, let's put the modern era of football at the Olympics in context. In the modern era, or shall we say every edition of the tournament since 1992, there have been some memorable moments and records. In Atlanta in 1996, Nigeria became the first African nation to win Olympic gold in football after beating Argentina 3-2. Argentina, meanwhile, have also much to be proud of, after winning back-to-back -back Olympic gold medals in 2004 and 2008. The team, led by the likes of Lionel Messi, Angel Di Maria, Sergio Aguero, and Carlos Tevez, also became only the fourth nation to achieve such a feat after Great Britain in 1908 and 1912. Uruguay in 1924 and 1928, and the aforementioned Hungary in 1964 and 1968. Brazil have since joined this elite club after winning the 2016 and 2020 Olympic Games. They are undoubtedly the strongest team of the last decade after also winning silver in 2012. On the other hand, they did not take part in Paris 2024, which was the first Olympics in 20 years without Brazil. One of the big problems at the Olympics, however, is injury. Clubs are often reluctant to release their key players for the Olympics because of the risk of injury and the pressure of adding another tournament to their schedule. The big issue is that the Olympics always clash with other major tournaments taking place in the same summer, such as the European Championships, for example. And it just so happened in the summer of 2024, the Olympics kicked off just 10 days after Euro 2024 ended. Players such as Barcelona's Fermin Lopez and Villarreal's Alex Baena were part of the Spanish senior team that won the European Championship, and less than five days later were in Paris to start their preparations for the Olympics. Yeah, the two did not technically play an active role in Spain's Euro triumph, but there are far more serious examples such as Pedri's at Euro 2020, and then the Tokyo Olympics. At the time, the Barcelona youngster was one of Spain's key players on their way to the semifinals of Euro 2020, and less than a month later, he was playing in an Olympic final. All of this after having already played over 50 games for Barca in the previous season. This left a hugely negative impact on his physique, 
and to this day, he suffers from a variety of injuries, which the doctors say are the result of the enormous amount of pressure that he's been under. And now for the answer you've all been waiting for. Why is football the only sport at the Olympics to start before the opening ceremony? Well, the reason is not surprising at all, but is purely organizational. Going back to the subject we were discussing earlier, since the players have to endure such a heavy workload, they need at least three days of rest between games. So, given the number of teams and matches, an early start will ensure that the tournament can be completed without too much overlap with other Olympic events. So, what do you think? How could Olympic football be made more interesting to watch? Also, do you like the current format? Let us know in the comments down below. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.